The Money Cafe is proudly brought to you by InvestSmart, Australia's first cap management fee investment service. Your wealth grows, your fees don't. T's and C's apply. Find out more at investsmart.com.au. Hello, I'm Alan Cole, founder of Eureka Report Finance Presenter on ABC News and a columnist for The New Daily. And I'm Stephen Mayne, contributor at Eureka Report, founder of Crikey, shareholder advocate and City of Manningham Councillor. And we, we are, are the, the Money, Money Cafe. Cafe. So, Stephen, apparently Origin's got the uh, higher bid this morning, is that correct? Yes, the great sale of the Aussie farm continues at pace. So, the foreign North American... Consortium, which are bidding for Origin Energy, have lifted their offer by 69 cents to $9.53 this morning, putting an extra $1.2 billion of cash on the table. And Aussie Super, with their 13.5%, which have been buying shares and trying to eke out a higher bid, have been successful in threatening to vote down the deal at the November 23 special meeting. But is Aussie Super saying yet whether they're going to accept this price? Well, this is only just broken this morning so you know it's a game of chicken and i think they'll be you're always trying to maximize the price by threatening to vote against so but my prediction is that this will now sail through because it's above the independent expert range of eight dollars 45 to nine dollars 48 so the hundred and twenty-five thousand origin shareholders will re- receive close to 16 billion in cash in january next year and all I've got to say about that was what the hell was the Origin Board doing back in 2008 when they rejected an offer from BG at $15.50 a share? So for the last 17 years or 15 years, all they've done is uh, get a takeover at uh, six bucks less than what they were offered in 2008. Well done, chaps. <laughs> Yes, that's fantastic. Are you worried about the farm going? I mean, Invocare got taken over by TPG, the private equity firm this week. Newcrest went two or three weeks ago into the belly of Newmont. We need Gina Reinhardt. I mean, Gina Reinhardt is a patriot. She stormed into Lion Town and bought a 20% stake to block their takeover. She oh, stormed into Azua. This is because of patriotism. She's a patriot on mining. I want Gina to be a patriot on utilities and I want her to buy 19.9% of origin. So Gina can own everything. Still- Gina well, can own everything and good for, good for her because she's a patriot. She's a patriot. No one can work out what she's doing because she never explains herself. <laughs> Honestly, but then Stephen, though, any mining company that's going to get taken over, Gina will, if she can afford it, will buy a blocking stake to, to stop the foreigners getting our farm. Go Gina. That's ridiculous. Well, why do you think she spent $1.3 billion buying 20% of Lion Town? Because she wanted 20% of Lion Town. She's already she's down about $400 million. I mean, it was the stupidest investment ever. The, the takeover bid went away and they did a capital well, raising. Okay. They diluted her. I, I and- simply do not believe she did it out of patriotism. You've got to be joking. When I, mean, I put up a city, when I put up a motion at the City of Melbourne to condemn Rio Tinto for ending their Melbourne head office and calling on them to move their head office from London to Australia. Did you really? Did you I put, put up, up that motion. You put up that and motion. The, and the Green Council has said we'd normally be, be uh, blockading the Rio Tinto head office, but we will vote for this, this motion. I sent a copy to Gina and she faxed back her support because she's a patriot. She <laughs> wants Rio Tinto to be headquartered Jesus. in Australia, not London. And she faxed back her support and I quoted it in the chamber. We've had a fax from Gina Reinhardt. She agrees with this motion that Rio Tinto should move their headquarters to Australia. Look, you can say what you like about Gina. She is a patriot. Well, a I think rich it's, a, it's a wonder, Stephen, that you weren't immediately appointed mayor on the basis of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never be mayor, Alan. You know that. Too mad for that. Now, you had a cracking column this morning on the end of the world and climate and I thought it was one of your best columns I've ever read and I gave it a plug on Twitter and you did and I think you should briefly summarise the situation because it was fantastic in oh well it was simply that um, that and nobody's really picked up on it in Australia but the talks the fourth round of talks over what's called the loss and damaged fund loss and damage fund was um, agreed upon at last year's uh, COP27 meeting in, um, uh, where was it? Oh, crikey. Oh, in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. Egypt, yeah. 
so they, it was the only thing, really concrete thing to come out of that meeting was that they all agreed that we'd, uh, we'd work on establishing a loss and damage fund to compensate um, developing countries that are suffering the effects of climate change. Mm. Uh, they had four meetings. Uh, two weeks ago, the fourth meeting collapsed in disarray, um, uh, basically sabotaged by the United States, saying we're not going to pay anything. Uh, well, we're not going to pay much. We're certainly not going to pay the sort of money that's required. And anyway, we want it to be in the world in a fund run run by the World Bank, uh, which is going to charge seventeen percent hosting fee per annum. And the developing countries are outraged at this and said, "You've got to be joking." And um, so they all worked all, all walked away. And uh, basically, it means that the next meeting, COP twenty eight, starting on November the thirtieth, um, uh, in Dubai. Uh, is going nowhere. Yeah. So your basic and, and the sort of thesis was we're going to the dogs on climate. Meanwhile, there's a military arms race, and all the Americans and the Chinese are interested in is their global power, and and they're not dealing with the climate. And um, meanwhile, over in London, there's a massive AI summit. Um, I was talking to a former ASX 50 CEO in the last couple of weeks who was catastrophizing about climate and AI and insurrections and warning his kids to travel now while they can. So uh, This is an ASX... An ASX 50, 50 CEO, CEO. Who I bumped into at an AGM, chatting away, and I've never heard a doomsday scenario like it from a serious business figure about loss of jobs from AI, climate, uh, insurrections and wars, and he's telling his kids to travel now while they can. And I thought, wow... Well, COVID I was, uh, really has got to some people. I was talking yesterday to a ASX, not a fifty, possibly possibly an ASX one thousand. A wee bit, a wee bit nano, a wee co- bit smaller than that. The company, the company is called Wee Bit Nano. Uh, the CEO's name is Kobe Hannock. He lives in Tel Aviv, or a, just an outer suburb, I think, of Tel Aviv. Uh, and I interviewed him yesterday morning for Eureka Report. It was published. Was it published this morning, Greg? Yep. Yeah, I read it. Morning. You read it? So uh, the interview... Subscriber only. Subscriber only, that's right. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> I feel your record report. Anyway, he, I, I, so I spent the first kind of 10 minutes of the interview asking him, what's it like there now? And, and basically, they're go, he's going into, the, um, they're going into the, the air raid shelter every 10 minutes. I mean, I don't know how they're getting any work done, honestly. But... Uh, <laughs> Well, their AGM's coming up. I said to him, "Why don't you? Why don't you move? You move don't have to, to Australia. You don't have to live in Tel Aviv. You're listed on the ASX. Come move and live to Australia. in Melbourne or Sydney." He says, "No, no, I love Israel. I don't want to live anywhere. It's the greatest place on earth. I mean, I cannot imagine a worse place on earth at the moment than Israel. Honestly, um, but there you are. Everyone to their own, I guess." Yeah, well, there's quite a few sort of Israel-based dual-listed companies on the yeah. ASX. It's been a good learner for the ASX. It's not dual-listed. This, co- this company, and none of these companies are dual-listed. Well, they're basically just listed here. Yeah. Listed here, that's it. Yeah, yeah. But they're in Israel. They're technology companies. Yeah. Like Webit Nano, it's a very interesting business, actually. It, it um, uh, makes a, a, a semiconductor that is they're hoping or trying to get to replace flash memory, which has been the... You know the main memory for forty years that that uh, uh, in basically every device is flash memory, and um, they've got this thing that is a hundred times faster and a hundred times cheaper and all this stuff that they're trying to get it to replace. But there's so much inertia; everyone's using flash in all the phones and devices, whatever it is, um, that uh, nobody wants to change really. So they're struggling. Well, they're not struggling; they're just taking a while to get going. Mm. Well, I've got them on my list of uh, now in the ASX 300. Uh, never harassed them. On the bucket list, I better turn up at their AGM and buy some shares. So um, I hope they're doing a hybrid and welcoming shareholders from Israel to Antarctica to attend via the internet. And if you, I'll, I'll read your piece and fire a few questions in at him. Excellent. Now, we should say that um, uh, I went to the Endeavour Group AGM during the week. And uh, I broke my six-question rule, Alan. I lobbed 11. They read out nine. And it was quite amusing because I've always been getting stuck into the Mathesons. But because the Mathesons were hostile to the board, 
I was able to lob these incredibly hostile questions at the Mathesons, which the chair and the company was quite happy to read out. <laughs> <laughs> Albeit with a bit of a uh, little bit of censorship because I probably went a so little your bit questions, too hard. So your questions were directed at the Mathesons? At Bruce, well, at Bruce Matheson Jr. who was up for election. So I was saying, why don't you resign? You know, you guys are a disgrace. Your dad's campaign is ridiculous. Um, you know, you go far too hard on the pokies. You're ruthless. You lost a hundred million punting on star. And, and the chairman reluctantly read well, out your well, questions well, no, they about them a little bit. what a the, disgrace it is. The question wrangler <laughs> censored them a little bit because I was going a bit over the top. But it's they basically you, got Stephen. they basically got there, and and so I was put. While well, Roger Corbett was abusing, eighty one year old Roger Corbett was abusing the chair from the floor. I was abusing the Mathesons from my my home in my pajamas with online questions. And at the end of the day, the board won. Bill Wavish only got twenty seven percent. Bruce Matheson didn't turn up because he was crook. He's still threatening to call an EGM. But if he calls an EGM. What the board will do is they'll add to the agenda of the of the EGM the, the removal of Bruce Matheson Jr. from the board. Yep. And the numbers are there. Twenty seven percent backed the Matheson candidate, Bill Wavish. The rest of the board got back, no problems. And so uh, I think the Mathesons are cornered and have nowhere to go. And then we've got Qantas tomorrow, Alan. So what's going to happen? Your Qantas? son's been ringing me, asking for a chat ahead of that. It's a bit. All these journalists are ringing up. What's going to happen tomorrow? Well. I, uh, well, I told him to ring you, so yeah, yeah. is that okay? That's good. That's good. I have to, I have to ring him back So, because um, he's your son. But um, You do have to ring I him do. back. Correct. Correct. He's a very important person. So, um, But uh, my prediction, I was previously saying that Todd Sampson, the Gruen advertising guru, would get voted off the board. But strangely, two of the four proxy advisors, CGI and ISS, are recommending he be re-elected. After 10 years on the board as a brand guru. They're not paying attention to you, Stephen. Well, What's going well, on? The, the really weird thing with ISS is ISS recommended a vote against Maxine Brenner. Maxine Brenner, who's, I shouldn't, you can't say this, but I will, is the, is the wife of Jody Rich, the founder of OneTel. Anyway, she's had this, this big corporate board career for the last 10 years. Has been on the Qantas board. So ISS recommended against her at Telstra. So she got a double-digit protest vote at Telstra based on her record at Qantas. But when it comes to Todd Sampson at Qantas, who is a brand guy who's overseen the trashing of a brand, ISS says, we need to retain corporate memory. Let's keep Todd Sampson on. So ISS is the most powerful of the proxy advisors. They have a donkey vote from the big index funds, Vanguard, State Street and BlackRock, roughly about 15% in most companies. So that decision by ISS will save Todd Sampson tomorrow at Qantas. But they'll still get a remuneration strike. Um, they should announce the proxies early because, you know, you sit there and you go, what's the proxy position? And they'll hold it back and we'll have a five-hour slugfest and then the business will go on. And So uh, sp speaking of my son, yes. he's helping me launch my quarterly essay on housing at Reading's bookstore on November the 29th. Who's interviewing who? Well, we're going to have a discussion, but he'll be interviewing me and I'll be interviewing him. Cola and Cole, first time in public? Yeah. Lovely. Cola and Cola. Now, uh, and, 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 and the listeners of the Money Cafe could uh, can uh, invite it to attend. It's free. You just have to book a ticket on the Readings website. So that was one word from our sponsor. And before we go to questions, let's have another one. You keep being told you should invest in ETFs, but every time you look, there's hundreds of them and a lot of them look the same. And just like last month and the last three years, you switch off and do nothing. Invest Smart are the ETF experts and make it easy with ETF portfolios designed to help you achieve your investment goals served up on a digital paperless platform. Check out investsmart.com.au for more information. It's smart investing made easy. Lisa says, first question, I'm 40 and my super is managed by a financial advisor in a wrap account. The composition of the super is all Australian shares with good dividends. The financial advisor says not to consider how much the super balance has increased each year, even to the point where he says, throw the statement in the bin. His view is that we are creating a stream of dividends for retirement, so the focus is on that as opposed to capital gains. Do you agree with this proposition? Fees are 2.1%. No, I don't agree with that proposition. Fees at 2.1% are way too high. Way too high. Way I too high. I think Stephen and I both agree about that. 2.1% is too and, high. And of course you don't throw your statement in the bin. The scoreboard, i.e. how much money you have retained of mine, 
uh, measured daily, monthly, quarterly under your supervision is an accountability mechanism as to how you're going, mate. So don't and just I, say, I, look at the dividends, look I, at the capital I, growth as well. It all matters. And unless your um, financial advisor is a relative, I reckon he should be thrown in the bin. Correct. Lisa, give him the punt. Maybe go with ETFs or a, or a low low fee industry fund. Andrew says, it seems the current wars going on are playing a part in long, sticky inflation. Is there any economic history that shows wars drive inflation or does inflation drive war? And I'm hoping if the battlegrounds settle down, we could see an easing of this stifling inflation. Well, wars are inherently inflationary. Inflationary, correct, um, particularly on the oil side. But this one, so, this one so far is not very inflationary. I mean, the oil price has not moved much. There's a lot of talk about it. The oil price has not gone up much. The gas, the global gas price has gone up a lot, but we're not really subject to that. Um, and so in terms of Australian inflation, not yet much of an impact, bit of an impact from gas elsewhere. Um, uh, I mean, wars that you're involved in are inflationary, obviously. Yes, yes. And I would argue the Ukraine war was much more inflationary. Well, it was. With wheat, wheat and yeah. oil and sure. gas in particular, because yeah. they're just a far bigger cog in the global economic wheel at Ukraine. So. Uh, last Thursday, Brendan says Last Thursday, Michelle Bullock and other members of the RBA spoke before the Senate Standing Committee on Economics. One of the questions posed to Mrs. Bullock was Do interest rate hikes negatively impact the financing of new residential bills? Her long-winded response pointed to a yes. If this is the case, why can't the RBA admit that interest rates are fueling the housing crisis, which in turn pushes up house prices and rents, which in turn make the RBA increase interest rates? How are we going to build more houses if we can't finance the bloody things? Well, I mean, at one level, it is correct to say that rising interest rates do make it harder to finance uh, new builds. And that's why, for mine, the answer to the housing crisis is not the Victorian government kneecapping councils to fast track the issuing of new permits, it's for the government to step in and start financing the existing 120,000 permitted homes that are sitting dormant because people can't get finance or find buyers. So um, that, that, is, that is the challenge. But it, it is correct. You jack up your rates and they will probably go up next Tuesday. Are you, are you on that horse, Alan, on Melbourne Cup Day that we're going up another 25 basis points? Look, I think on balance they probably will, but I don't think they need to. I don't I'm against increasing the interest rates next Tuesday. Um, I don't think it's a good idea. I think interest rates have gone up enough. I mean, we've uh, we've heard time and time again, including from the Reserve Bank, that monetary policy takes at least 12 months to ha- have a, to ta- take effect. Uh, it's now November 2023. Uh, there was still about five months worth of rate hikes to go last November. I mean, if if monetary policy does take 12 months, uh, we're still uh, not much more than halfway through the thing, the the impact of last last year's rate hike. So I think they need to just wait. Well, I'm not going to join the Michelle Bullock pile on. I thought Jim Chalmers has been jawboning her inappropriately. I think it's unfair that she doesn't have a deputy governor or a head of research. She's a one woman standing there. And I think that the data points to one more modest increase on Cup Day and we should just support our new central bank governor for that decision when it comes, even though it will cause a lot of pain. But if it's just one more and then that's it, that's what the data is pointing to. We're still overheating too much, in my view. Okay. I'm speechless. What? Come on. One little increase. That's what the market is saying. One little increase. You're just being populist here. I'm being populist? Yeah, you're being populist. You're just looking for votes. I'm not a politician. No. You're looking for votes. (laughs) For votes. Okay, hero of the battler, turn. hero of the mortgagee. Peter says, I listened to your 26th to the 10th podcast with James Thompson, pondering whether Magellan and other fund managers skewed to listed stocks might be going the way of the dodo. My question is, how best to get some private markets exposure into my portfolio, either directly or via an aggregator fund? I probably qualify as a sophisticated investor. Would something like Hamilton Lane Global Private Assets Funds do the trick, either investing in one of their funds or buying HL shares? Any other private market funds out there with a solid performance and reasonable fees? Now, as a non-sophisticated investor, Alan, who doesn't have two and a half million dollars of assets to splash into the market, this is beyond my pay grade, and I don't know that we should be plugging particular private assets fund managers. But I do agree with Peter that I do think that the listed, the fund manager 
which focuses on listed stocks only, you know, the perpetuals and the Magellans of the world, I do think they are un in massive structural decline because of ETFs and low-fee industry funds and the like. It's very difficult for very large funds to outperform ETFs, that's true, because... Yeah, I mean, they just they can't really invest in small companies, and and big companies are basically the ETFs. Yeah, the, you know, I mean, so they they can't do better than the ETFs, and they can't ch they can't compete with them on price. That's where something like you know the situation with Origin at the moment, Perpetual is the next biggest shareholder after Aussie Super. So if they can use their power to eke out another dollar a share and get a big payday on origin relative to their entry price, then that might deliver some outperformance, which they say, hey, we're be we've beaten ETFs and we've beaten... Um, yeah, but the ETFs pick up a, b a bit of that too. But I they're mean, overweight. So the, the, point, overweight. the point is, right. is, is, is can stock pickers outperform in the long term? And the long term shows that, that no, because their fees are too high. And in the long term, the ETFs do better. And, and there will be the odd stock picker that comes in there and goes, you know, we're, we're brilliant, but it won't last. The dogs are barking for the stock pickers. The dogs are barking for the stock pickers. I reckon they're in strike. Very good. <laughs> yes. Hayden says, we've seen companies facing declines in their stock prices in the past, past due to unfavourable press and negative publicity. For instance, Meta, with data breaches and declining users, and Netflix with a slowdown in subscriber growth. Yet those companies made comebacks when the publicity subsided. Do you believe a similar situation is unfolding at Qantas? Despite the prevailing negative news, is the company is the market underestimating how much it will truly impact the company's profits? Well, look, I think Qantas, I paid $6.10 a share a couple of months ago for my 83 shares. So I'm already down of 130 bucks because they're at $4.95. And I think that is a case of a pile-on has caused loss of share market value because, you know, the regulators are moving against them. The ACCC. It's like Crown. When Crown copped a pylon and Star Entertainment caused by, like, Nick McKenzie, the regulators came in and smashed them and there was a permanent destruction of value in the, of those casino licences. But I think Qantas ultimately is going to make a billion a year. It's got massive market power. It's got regulatory benefits. And I think it will... This storm will pass. But other... Pylons have not passed. AMP has never recovered from their various scandals and pylons. And uh, um, so, yeah. Now, Adam says, can you please explain if theme ETFs are a bit of a scam? An investment in RBTZ, an ETF that supposedly follows AI and robotics, has the same price as it had three years ago. I thought I was early to the AI party, but Jap Chap GPT, Bard and the rest have barely had any impact on this new ETF. And somehow I'm still in the red. The biggest shareholding is NVIDIA, which has doubled in the same time. Does beta shares simply rip all the profit out with, with, with buying and selling and charging fees? Now, Adam, I'm waiting for the, 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 the lithium ETFs and the crypto ETFs. So yes, theme ETFs, I personally think, are often a sign of a bubble. And the more exotic the ETF, the more the sign that it is a bubble. And I'm not surprised to hear that this uh, AI robotics ETF has not delivered the promised land because, um, you know, they're often late to the party and stick but with the broad ETFs on well, broad countries or mining or gold. Don't get into the exotics, I would say. Well, I'd also say don't just buy a theme ETF because of the theme. You've got to look at what's in it. Yes. Exactly what's in it. Because And the timing of Because in the RBTZ in ETF, there will not be chat GPT since it's not listed. Correct. There won't be BARD because it's, it's a part, part of, of Google. Google. Yeah. Um, so would Google be in it? I, I don't know. I mean, that's the question. And in, is NVIDIA in it? Because... Yes. If that's the biggest holding. So NVIDIA is the most obvious pure AI play out there. Yeah. But you can just buy that direct. There's just not enough AI stocks to create a balanced global ETF in that and robotics, I would but say. I, look, I, I do think that it isn't correct to say that beta shares rips all the profit out no, by no, buying and no. selling and charging fees. No, no, I take that back too. <laughs> no, but... <laughs> you've got to look at the fee, whatever the fee is. I mean, that is true that the theme ETFs do tend to charge more than... 
plain vanilla yeah. ETFs. So there is a there is a fee issue as well. Yes, yes, and I would I would I would steer clear. I think we've only got time for what one more question. Oh no, no, two, we got we got more. plenty of time, Alan. Let's go with uh, Nina is asking a question about her hex, and look, I think we can just cut to the chase and say that it is unfair that HEX is rising with inflation and if Albo wants to win the next election and not lose more seats to the Greens, he should freeze all HEX debts because it's hurting the young as they try and save to buy into the impossibly overpriced housing market and they're watching their HEX debts soar with inflation and uh, this brutal indexation. And uh, yep, I think I it's going to hurt Labor if they don't uh, fix it. Caitlin says, I've been listening to Money Cafe for a while and each and I cringe each time I hear the word chairman. Is it not time the term was retired and simply replaced with chair? What we hear, see and experience impacts our behaviours and these once de facto terms are a subtle reminder that we still have so far to come in terms of equality and female participation at senior levels. Uh, well, I agree. I, I so, agree. So, Caitlin, from this moment on, I will never say that word again. At an AGM, I will say, good morning, Chair, and then start asking questions, just like I object to the phrase granny flats, which is being trotted out in Victoria at the, at the moment about how they're going to kick council permitting power out of people who want to build a small second home. So granny flats. It's not why isn't it grandpa flats? So we need to degender the language of these things. And speaking of chairs, I just want to do a brief shout-out to the chair of Vicinity Centres, Trevor Gerber, yesterday. We talked previously, Alan, about whether Chadston was worth $6.6 billion, given that the stock is trading at a 20% discount to the claimed NTA. So I said to him yesterday, mate, if you sold Chadston, hand on heart, do you reckon you could sell it for $6.6 billion? And he said, hand on my heart, I reckon we could. And I should have said, go ahead and make my day and give us the cash. because." Uh, but then he said, we've sold a small shopping centre in... Broad Meadows and another one in northern Melbourne for more than book value. So that proves that our NTA is true. I'm going, well, that's quite good for little rats and my centres somewhere, but if you put Chadston on the market, I reckon they would struggle to get a bid at more than $5 billion, and they are saying it is worth $6.6 billion, all 31 hectares of it, one of the world's biggest shopping centres, which is 50% owned by John Gandell, the billionaire. And I was talking to someone yesterday saying... That's probably the largest single site holding by an individual in Australia. So one bloke owns 50% of a 31 hectare shopping centre worth 6.6 billion, and that's worth 3.3 billion in his hands. One bloke owns that, John Gandel. I was talking yesterday. I had coffee yesterday with the, uh, the guy who owns um, the shopping centre in Mackay, oh, yeah. and he says to me, um, "Every single person. It's the only shopping centre in Mackay." And uh, he says every single person in Mackay goes to that shopping centre at least once a fortnight and spends $71 each. <laughs> He's so pleased with himself. <laughs> now, let's finish off with Rowan. Okay. Warren Buffett famously said that it's wise for investors, quote, to be fearful when others are greedy and to be greedy only when others are fearful. Do you think we are now in a period when others are fearful or is Mr Buffett referring to a greater level of fear like a big market crash um, yes well the the uh, if you if you look at the, the fear index which is the VIX uh, which is the index of volatility it's up a little bit but not very much certainly nowhere near what it was in the GFC or the uh, or the pandemic um, so uh, that's the kind of the quantitative way of measuring it if, if you've got a if you th if you're f fearful yourself, you think that everyone should be more fearful than is shown by the VIX index, then you might want to um, uh, be uh, greedy. Yeah, I would say this is nothing. I've seen quite a few uh, genuine fearful, whether it was the 87 crash, the, the Keating recession we had to have, the Asian financial crisis in 98, the tech wreck in 2000, the, the GFC, the pandemic. This is not yet in the top six fear cycles of my lived experience, but it's getting a little wobbly. And I think if the market falls another, I think you could be waiting for a 10% fall before cashing into the market, I would say. It's interesting. Um, I, was, I, was, I was reflecting on Halloween the other day, um, that, uh, that Hall uh, Halloween 2007 is when the market peaked. Mm. 
uh, it was actually November the 1st, so the day after. It was actually on All Hallows Day, mm. which is not – which is the day after All Hallows Eve, which is Halloween. Anyway, um, the, the market currently is 2.2% above that peak in uh, 2007. So 16 years, the market's gained 2%. It was a hell of a peak, that though, wasn't it? I mean, that was a hell of a hell of a bubble. And, and, it and went. there's a lot of pain out there. I mean, the, I was at the Cromwell AGM yesterday, and they're they're claiming they're worth 2.2 billion. Yet the market cap's 8.35. There's a missing 1.35 billion, and they just said we're getting clobbered by interest rates. We're, we've done a fire sale of property assets. We've sold off 600 million so far. Hasn't fixed our gearing because we're selling at less than market, and we stupidly. Put 1.4 billion into European property yeah, well when interest this, rates were zero, and so now they're blo- getting flogged as interest rates go up. This bloke who I had coffee with yesterday, who owns the Mackay Shopping Centre, owns a lot of commercial property around mm. Australia. Mm. He reckons it's going to be a bloodbath next mm. year, particularly in office. Office yeah. office property next year is going to be, he says, a bloodbath. Well, that was my com- that was the comment at both Cromwell and vicinity yesterday. Is if you really believe your NTA is this strong, why aren't you doing massive buybacks? And the chair said we haven't got the cash. And I said, Chair, you own thirty million bucks worth of Ariadne shares, and they're a company just down the road in Brisbane. Sell a few of them and start buying our shares at thirty-two cents because you're claiming they're worth eighty-two cents and they're trading at thirty-two cents because the market doesn't believe that you've got net assets of two point two. And the, the market is pricing uh, in a bloodbath. And the market's right. The market is right. There is a coming bloodbath in property and that could well get into Particularly housing office prices property. and So I asked this guy prices. how much of the bloodbath is due to working from home and uh, he says, well, a lot of it, uh, but not all of it. Mm. So if you know anyone who'd be prepared to buy Chadston for $6.6 billion, then they don't believe in a bloodbath coming, do they, if they reckon Chadston's worth I- I'd buy it billion. for old time's sake because I used to go there to play 10-pin bowling when I was a kid. Yeah. You know. It's about half the size of Gaza, that place. It's absolutely – I can't believe there's a shopping centre that big. <laughs> I mean – Westfield we Doncaster is only worth you know one point nine billion. You have to stop. Is. You have to stop rabbiting on, Stephen. Yeah, we're getting the wind up from Greg. And um, right anyway, on. Guru. Great, Thanks everyone great for call listening this to today's episode of the Money Cafe. I'll be back next week with James Thompson. Send in your questions to the Money Cafe at EurekaReport.com.au. Until then, I'm Alan Kohler. and I'm Stephen Main. I run out.